Okay. Thank you, everybody, and welcome. I'm Ruth Rose. I'm a member of the Adult Programs Committee at First Parish. Um, first order of business is that you. This session is being recorded. If you do not want to be recorded, please turn off your video. Uh, so today's speaker is Katie O'Hare Gibson, who has been coming to First Parish in Lexington since 2007 with her family. She has served our church on the Religious Education Committee, the board, and the racial justice team. Outside of church, uh, Katie was an early childhood, that is pre-K to first grade, teacher for 25 years in Lexington and in Dorchester. She currently serves as interim co-principal of an elementary school in Lexington. Uh, Katie has led school-based equity teams in Lexington, which develop and implement professional development opportunities for teachers in the interest of creating schools that offer an education centered on justice. She also co-created a curriculum, which I highly recommend, Dismantling Racism in Our Town, which was developed in order to give adults the knowledge, tools, and networking opportunities they need to dismantle local systems of oppression and discrimination. Katie is dedicated to this work in response to the words of Lilia Watson. If you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. Katie. Thank you, Ruth. And I think that quote that's there is um, part of something I put out when I do that other justice work. And I think the work that I do in schools and connecting it to our UU faith is justice work too. So hopefully you'll hear that a bit in this. Um, so I was asked to talk about my experience leading a school in a pandemic. <laughs> um, and hopefully that's why you're here, that you thought that would be interesting. So I'm just gonna get right into it um, and make sure my sharing screens works properly. You can all see that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, so I decided to call this mandalas and mosaics um, because as I've gone through these past almost two years now, um, as we all have together, these are things that are connected to our UU faith, at least in the way that I look at it and I practice, um, and things that I pulled on throughout my time over the past two years up until today um, to help navigate this work. So I'm just going to kind of take you a little bit on a journey of what it's been like to be an administrator um, during COVID here in Lexington. Um, oop, did that not advance? Oh, there it goes. It's just a little lagged. There we go. Um, so back in March 2020, um, you'll see on the left there, that's the gorgeous new Hastings School, if you have not yet seen it. And it's a net zero school. So cool. It's the biggest elementary school in town. Um, and it's amazing and beautiful. And we had just moved in. At the time, I was the assistant principal. It was my first year at Hastings. And um, February 14th was the day we physically moved into the new building and then it was vacation. So we had been in the school for about three weeks. And on March 12th, 2020, the principal Louise Lipsitz and I were spending the day interviewing um, because we were going from the smallest or one of the smaller elementary schools in town to now this larger one. You may or may not know that there were some elementary schools that were overcrowded um, because Districting had put too many kids in some buildings and that was part of why we built this much larger building for Hastings so we could redistrict um, students to make things 
more even, more equitable so that we would have right-sized schools. Um, and so part of that was that as we opened the new school in September, 2020, the plan was to go from about 425 students to almost 625 students, which meant adding a bunch of teachers. So on March 12th, we were busy interviewing an amazing kindergarten teacher who at the time was working at Harrington. We were interviewing her to come join our team. And we were walking back from taking her to her classroom. We had gone down to show her her classroom. And as we were walking back to the hall, um, through the hall, back to the office, all of our phones started ringing, <laughs> which was really odd to have all three of them going off at once. So I knew something was up. Um, and so that was, I didn't actually answer it at the time, but as soon as we said goodbye to Miss Anderson. Um, I checked because I thought that's going to be something from the district for all three of us to go at once. And it was. It was the robocall from Dr. Julie Hackett, the superintendent, telling us that um, we were going to be closed for two weeks. So we can all laugh at that now <laughs> when we say two weeks. And I do remember um, talking to um, many of you know Jordan um, and his girlfriend's parents are scientists and are work in in the field of epidemiology and um, creating the vaccines and all of that. And I remember just a couple of days later saying, oh, yeah, we're going to close for two weeks. And her father just laughing and go, oh, you think so? Huh? <laughs> um, so I see that he knew what he was talking about back then. Um, and so for me at the time as assistant principal, the next two weeks really were a pause. Um, it just, it felt like, I don't know how many of you were around and remember after the Boston Marathon bombing, I remember that. I had the same feeling again, like everything was just quiet and eerily still, and it was a beautiful day outside, but no one was outside. That's what those two weeks really felt like for me. Um, at the same time, people who were a little higher up than me in the, um, in the administration did not feel like a pause at all. They were meeting all day, every day, virtually, figuring out the Zoom thing, but trying to figure out what are we going to do? And you all know how quickly everything was changing. Um, and so after those two weeks, um, my role as the assistant principal was really supporting teachers, trying to figure out what this Zoom thing was, <laughs> how it worked, how they were going to meet the needs of students um, in this new world that none of us had ever done before. And certainly no one had tried to teach elementary school and imagine kindergarten um, on Zoom. So that was, you know, the spring of 2020 was really my role was about doing that, about just really supporting teacher and teachers and helping them adjust their expectations and figure out what they were going to do. Um, at the same time, I put this up, you may have seen something like this before. Um, we were really, as we were doing this work and figuring out how, what school was going to look like, how to support everyone, we were really focused on equity and how we would do this well. Um, and we already had an equity team. We were already thinking about these things, um, but the pandemic for me, and I know for many of you, really shone a light on how we need to make sure we're being equitable. And it really um, impressed on us as we were planning for remote learning, being in Lexington, um, most of our families had access to devices. Most of our families had easy access to the internet, but there are some families who didn't. And so we were really trying to think about who needs devices? How do we get them to everyone? How is this going to work? Um, and I admit it wasn't a big talk across the district, although a little bit, but something I was really thinking about is, should we? Should we go ahead and use our devices and do remote learning when I know in New Bedford, the families are being much more hit by the pandemic than in Lexington. You know, many families there don't have the access to devices and internet. And are we just going to fast forward this gap that already exists? And so that's something I was really wrestling with of how we meet the needs of our families and do what we can for them, but make sure we're thinking more broadly and thinking about everyone even outside of our district. Um, and so summer of 2020, like, you know, we've all gotten used to, was just a lot of trying to plan for the unknown. 
and how the goalposts kept on moving all the time. And so this is where the mandala comes in. Um, my work in summer of 2020 was trying to make a schedule for the school and trying to figure out who has PE and who has art, you know, on what day and what time and when everyone has reading and writing and, and all of that um, for K to five. So remembering that we had gone from a, a, a school with about 19 or 20 classrooms to one with 27 classrooms. So already there was an added burden of trying to figure out how to schedule that many more classes and fitting all of this in. Um, but because of the pandemic, everything kept changing. <laughs> and, um, you know, instead of a 8.30 to 3.15 day, we were changing to an 8.30 to 2.30 day, putting specials outside of the school day instead of inside of the school day. Um, we were trying to figure out hybrid learning, which again, no one had ever done before. Um, and what that looked like in Lexington, we still didn't know. Um, it ended up, if you don't know, being kids who did hybrid learning came to school for five days and then studied from home for five days and alternated and then had to have um, cohorts. So cohorting students thinking about your blue week was the week you were studying in school, your yellow week was the week you were studying from home. Um, and making sure that our, blue, you know, when you were in school, the classes were uh, balanced. And then on top of that, making sure that siblings were, had the same blue weeks and yellow weeks. Um, so I am not kidding when I tell you every day <laughs> I was creating a schedule and being like, I got it. And then the next day I'd hear, oh, actually we can't do that. Or, you know, talk to a colleague and they needed the itinerant art teacher on that day. And so I needed to shift everything. Um, enrollment was all over the map. And I, I totally understand the parents, I don't blame them, but it was so frustrating to have families, you know, not deciding whether they wanted their kids in school or out of school and remote. And we even had people pulling their kids totally out of the Lexington public schools to try to put them in a private school, hoping that model would work better for their family. Or then doing that and finding, no, no, actually that model's not good, I'm gonna put them back in. Um, and so the mandala, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, that's how I pronounce it, I apologize, um, but was something that I learned, and this is, you know, the spirituality piece, as we were talking about it and everyone's pulling their hairs out and so stressed out, and all of a sudden, you know, it hit me, everyone was getting so frustrated, like, I just worked so hard on this, and I've got to throw it away and start over, and I was like, wait, <laughs> that's what this is, and my understanding of, you know, the, the, practice of making a mandala as a meditation is spending hours, days, sometimes weeks, just very quietly and calmly creating this beautiful design with colored sand. And, you know, it's usually on the ground and very intricate. And you can imagine takes strong concentration, a lot of time and effort. And then when it's done, taking a breath, taking in the beauty of what's been created, and wiping it all away. And it's the study of impermanence and letting go of things and not getting too caught up on things. At least again, this is how I've brought in this learning and how I've interpreted it. And that's what got me through that summer was knowing, you know, yep, I worked really hard on this and it's not, and, and now I have to start over and I'm gonna take what I learned from that, right? It got easier every time. Um, creating schedules used to take weeks. And then I joked after summer 2020, I'm going to be able to make a schedule in a day, <laughs> no big deal, because I really got used to the practice of what you need to think about and how to make it work. So that is one of the key symbols. Um, and for that whole year, the 2020, 2021 school year, I added this particular image to my signature on my emails. So anyone who got an email from me and my work email would see this little symbol. And most people didn't know what it was, but to me, it was just remembering like, yep, that's what this year is all about. Um, when we got back to school, these are just some pictures that I used to think this is what I was thinking about and focused on. 
we'd have weekly meetings about the cleaning solutions and which cleaning solutions we would use. And you see the fogger there. Um, at, at the beginning, you know, we still weren't sure what was going on and how this virus spread. And so we were really worried about surfaces. And so um, explaining to people about the custodians coming in every night and fogging the room, <laughs> which now I think sounds silly, but it was the best science that we had at the time. Um, so this was just trying to think about ventilation and masks and mass distancing and how to keep five-year-olds with masks on and distanced <laughs> all day long. Um, and that was you know, a lot of the work of the first half of that first year as we all just tried to get used to this new normal. Um, I'm bringing these images up again just to show that this was also a big focus of the work that we did professionally. Um, as again, you all lived through this too, just doing different things. Um, but we talked a lot about the dual pandemics and how what, there was COVID-19 as one, but um, the racial uh, upheaval of noticing racial injustice, which I think was really exacerbated or, you know, a light was shown on it through the pandemic that people really started to see the inequities in a way that they hadn't. Um, and so we really kind of took advantage of that. And we had our equity team meet weekly. And every week we, um, I'm sorry, the equity team met every other week. And then about four or five times through the year, in those meetings, we were creating professional development experiences for the staff to think about equality and equity and justice and how we would kind of make this happen in our schools. And I'll say we did see a lot of growth in our last one. Um, I had someone say like, wow, you know, I didn't think about these things before, but this year I've really started to understand myself and I've really seen a lot of growth. So that's a little bit of an aside, um, but again, is really connected to our UU faith and doing this work and first parish and the eighth principle, you know, doing that work. So I really see a connection to our faith in that there. Um, and I'm gonna just get through these last couple um, quickly. The other thing was food and eating. And so thinking about that mandala all over again, um, in April, 2021, we changed again. So um, we had, I talked about the hybrid learning and remote learning. I didn't mention out of our 600-ish students, about two thirds of them chose hybrid learning and about a third of them chose remote learning. And so what that meant was about 200 of our students learned from home every day. They just, their whole learning um, style for the year was remote learning to sit in Zoom and get all their learning that way. And that was an option. Um, their families chose that option for them. And then the other two thirds chose hybrid. So what that meant is we had about 200 kids at a time in the building, right? Um, because of the 400, half of them were in and half of them were out. Um, and so we figured out how to have 200 kids across six grades. So that was, you know, only about 50 kids per grade. We could pretty easily set up desks in the cafeteria and have everyone sitting at desks, six feet apart, all facing the same way so that when they were eating, we felt um, pretty safe. And as that first slide, um, that gorgeous new building, thank goodness, it has a great HVAC system. <laughs> and so no one, you know, I didn't know how important that would be at the time, but now I really appreciate um, that that we were really lucky that this pandemic hit after we moved in. In the other building, it would have been a much different experience. Um, but then when April of 2021 came, we went to all full time. So we still had the 200 kids doing remote learning, but there was no more hybrid. Now, anyone who came in the building came every day. So we doubled the number of students. And so trying to figure out eating, we were like, we can't fit double the kids in the cafeteria. We don't have that set up. We made a plan um, for some in the cafeteria, some in their classroom, but luckily 
something went right in the spring of 21 and the weather you may not may not remember but i remember because it was so important for this we had very few rainy days on school days anyway um in the spring of 2021 so our kids were able to eat outside and um they just we had x's on the ground and they spread out their six feet um, and as that spring went on some of the new data was being uh shared that it was really pretty safe to be outside unmasked. Um, so that was a blessing and that was great. Um, September 2021 was a whole new world again because now the state Department of Education said no more remote learning, it doesn't count. Um, so that's not an option in public schools. You may or may not know that. Um, and so now we went to 623 kids all day, every day. Um, and you know that business is normal. It's not normal, but we kind of are teaching the way we have been, just masked and still distanced as much as we could. Um, and so that brings us almost to today, January, 2022. Um, we can't eat outside anymore um, because <laughs> it's January in Massachusetts. Um, and but so we do have kids, um, some in the cafeteria, some in the classrooms. Um, we're not as strict anymore. We have them at tables. They're about four feet apart from each other when they're unmasked. Um, but luckily, we live in Lexington um, where we're well resourced and families generally um, we happen to live in an area where there's a lot of doctors and scientists and um, people in our community. So Lexington as a whole has a high vaccination rate. Um, this is from January 11th. And in fact, there's a new one that just came out, but I didn't change the slide. Um, vaccination rates for students um, are really high. So this is the vaccination rates at each school. So you can see the elementary schools are about six, we're about 60 to 70 percent vaccinated in uh, January 11th, and it's a little higher now because they've had more time to get vaccinated. Um, Lexington, you may or may not know, made it a policy that it was a condition of employment to be vaccinated to work in the schools. So except for those very few people who um, are, you know, have an exemption because of a health reason or something, our staff is fully vaccinated. So that has really helped me feel better about the decisions we had to make about students sitting at tables only four feet apart or so while eating. Um, and <laughs> this is um, the little reports I get for absent staff absences. So I just wanted to kind of point out what we were going through for those first couple of weeks coming back on January 6th, we had 18 staff absences, only four of them we had subs for. So we had seven, luckily, were people who are not classroom teachers who have a position where they didn't need a substitute. Um, but we had seven people who, you know, needed substitutes that we didn't have. Um, and we just, everyone was all in. <laughs> and our office staff who do lunch and recess are amazing. And they just worked double their hours and you know just worked whatever they could and covered as much as they could. And so we were really lucky to have a community that pulled together like that. A week later, you can see if um, the number was halved. We only had nine absences. Again, only three filled and a lot unfilled, um, but it's gotten better. and. I didn't update the slides since then. I put these together back then, but since then it's even gone down. So we did experience that spike like everyone around us um, that there was much higher absences. Um, the other thing that helps is the students. I don't know if you guys are aware that there's a dashboard that shares staff and student absences every week and has for the duration since September of 2020. Um, it's shifted a little bit as the science has changed of how it's reported out, but this is kind of what it looks like now. So again, you can see um, that first week back after vacation, 175 staff and students out. Um, I'm looking at a smaller one. Yeah, 78 staff. Um, and so about 100 students. Um, and then a week later, it was doubled almost again, um, 315 between staff and students. Um, it, much bigger leap in the students. So that also made it more manageable. 
because along with a lot of staff absences, we had a lot of student absences, but you can't in times of COVID, right? Say, oh, there's only 10 kids in this class and only 10 kids in that class. Let's just put them together. We're still doing our best to kind of maintain groupings and minimize that crossing. So that um, was part of it. And then I don't know who else is like crazy like me and checks the biobot data um, from the wastewater <laughs> every you know couple times a week, um, but also you know this has been kind of as we've ended and gotten to this point, it's really been nice to see that precipitous drop in cases, and so I do feel like we're seeing our way into and then over the next couple of weeks it getting even better. And again, because of our vaccination, high vaccination status, even with those really high cases, we haven't had, um, I almost don't wanna say it out loud, but um, we haven't had any serious illnesses at Hastings anyway. Um, as far as I'm aware, no hospitalizations and certainly no deaths. So um, we've been lucky there. Some of my friends um, from other communities have not been so lucky. Um, so I do you know, recognize that we've had as, as hard as this has been through all my like 20 slides of complaining that you've just seen um i also recognize that that we've been pretty lucky and saved from a lot of the hardest parts of this um and so the last piece that i want to share and some of you have heard this from me already um this is the most recent kind of piece of our faith that i've been thinking about i didn't get a picture well actually on my very first slide you may have noticed it if you're um aware there was this picture of a mosaic and that's an actual mosaic in the new hastings school that um the students students who are now middle schoolers i guess actually physically put together the artist came in and created a mosaic that hangs as like the you know when you first walk into the school it's central to the school and it's beautiful um and this piece i found in this book which is called bless the imperfect meditations for congregational leaders so it's actually um, a church kind of book and it's from Skinner House, the UU publishing. Um, but I really found this a couple of weeks ago and connecting that to the mosaic in our building, I really felt like this is another thing that's carrying me through um, doing this work and getting through the hard times. So I'm gonna just read it to you quickly. It's by Alicia, I'm not sure if she pronounces it, Alicia or Alicia Ford, um, and it's from Bless the Imperfect. And it says, you are mosaic makers, practitioners of justice, called to respond to brokenness in the world, restoring beauty by joining in solidarity with the least of these, the poor, the undocumented, the wrongly persecuted because of sex or gender or identity or race. You mosaic makers, practitioners of justice will minister to each other for this ministry needs your energy, your passion, your hands in order to thrive. It needs your wildly beating heart to animate its spirit. Being mosaic makers isn't easy. The pieces can be so tiny. It's difficult to see the whole picture. You always risk making a mistake and needing to undo. You will have moments of dis-ease, of needing to apologize, make amends, restore your covenant. You will have moments of fatigue, share leadership, invite others to share this vision and co-create with you. You mosaic makers, practitioners of justice, your work is act of gratitude for those who came before and for that which is yet to be. How blessed you are, how blessed we are to be in this together. And that is how I'm ending the presentation part. I hope you found that somewhat interesting. <laughs> um, I wasn't able to attend last week. So um, if you did, you know better how this goes than I do. But my understanding is we have time for Q&A if anyone has questions. Um, we um, It's easiest because there are um, 35 of us on the screen and I can't see you all. If you can use your virtual hand, which is the reactions button down at the bottom. Um, and if you open that, it says raise hand. Um, if you do have a question, it's best if you can try to use that feature because you pop up to the front and make it easier to see you. And I think everyone's muted. So if you do have a question, you'll have to unmute before speaking. I see Judy. Can 
me find the unmute button. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Katie, first of all, just as a taxpayer in Lexington, I, I'm enormously grateful for all you did and your colleagues to, to keep everything together as, as well as you did. I mean, it, it's extraordinary. It's I, And I hope your blood pressure has kind of gone back to normal after all this. Oh, well, we're just lucky, you know, as a community to have people like you hanging in there. Um, I just realized one thing that about uh, equity and justice and all, what about the Metco program during all this fluctuation? Did it have to discontinue? Has it now resumed? What, what went on with all of that? So it did not discontinue. Um, that was a big question though, because of especially thinking about buses and was it safe? Um, so I forget the exact numbers. There, it was more, there was a higher percentage of families in the Metco program who opted for that fully remote learning um, for that reason, because of not feeling safe. Um, and, you know, the students who live in Boston was disproportionately hit more so. So the communities that our Metco students live in, um, those families had more reason to, you know, kind of feel affected. Um, but it did not discontinue. And there are plenty of families who were like, nope, <laughs> I need my kid educated. I need them there. So the buses ran, the kids came. Um, we did make, um, we did have, I, I forgot to say this piece. In addition to the hybrid and remote, there was a very small number of kids who were allowed to come full-time even from the beginning, um, even from September of 2020. And we as school leaders for each school were allowed to make that decision. So Hastings actually had a higher number of kids doing that full-time learning than others, partly because we have a special ed program um, called the intensive learning program that's for students on the autism spectrum, but um, students who are verbal um, and, you know, are mainstreamed into the class, but really feeling like they needed to come full time to be able to get their education appropriately. And in addition to that, our team really focused on as best as we could any families that had particular hardships because of, you know, I can think of one resident Lexington resident family where um, the mother, it was a single mother who had a job that she's like, I, I can't, it, it was the kind of job she couldn't work from home and she couldn't afford to have someone come in and watch her child and she couldn't leave her child home all alone all day for a week. Um, so there was a small number of families like that, that we did. We were really careful to think about that. Um, but the MECA program in general, in, you know, in specific um, did continue and um, is still continuing and thriving now. Thank you. Thank you. I see Omar. Hi. Um, I, I, my question is about the impact on students. Is there um, any data or anecdotal um, information about, you know, how this experience has affected them either emotionally or academically or anything like that? Yeah, um, so we're actually doing our data team meetings <laughs> this week. Um, and I've met with um, third, fourth and fifth grade um, so far this week. And so looking at hard data from assessments, we actually have found that the students are doing amazingly with their academic data in literacy and math that um, really we're not at all concerned. Um, you know, of course, there's always a portion of kids, but we actually feel like in general, it looks amazing. It looks great as far as the academic data. Um, I'll, we'll do K1 and 2 later this week. It'll be interesting to see for those students because third, fourth, and fifth graders had at least a couple years of school that was normal. Um, our second graders are the ones who are kindergartners when school shut down for a couple months. Our first graders are the kids who their whole kindergarten year was this weird hybrid, you know, they never had a, any normal kindergarten 
Um, and then of course our current kindergartners are doing going what they're going through. So we'll look at that a little bit more, but academically for the most part, it seems okay. Um, we are noticing that anxiety is much higher for students in general. Um, also, we've just been saying recently um, how we've got a couple of families that are really in crisis, you know, like parents who are suffering with some kind of depression or other thing that's impacting their students. And so, you know, we were saying we've always had these issues, but we're seeing them more so. So I don't have hard data on that, but anecdotic, anecdotic, eh, I can't say that word. <laughs> um, you know what I'm trying to say. They, there is more anxiety among the students, the families, uh, the staff, um, you know, are more anxious in general. Um, and so, and we are, uh, I, I do feel like we've had to file more on families for things like abuse and neglect that I think some of that anxiety is manifesting in that kind of thing as well. Um, so there is some data to support that, but I would say academically, there hasn't been much of an impact. I think the students are doing really well emotionally and um, all of that. We are seeing the impact on people trying to struggle through. And, and so that's, you know, I joked about that, that slide where it said business as usual. It's not business as usual. And that's where a lot of the anxiety for the staff is coming from is a lot of people being like, okay, we just got to move on. This pandemic thing is exhausting. We've got to go on, but, but we can't but trying to figure out that balance of how we do try to move forward with some kind of normalcy to help everyone, um, but acknowledge that it's been hard and not try to ignore um, that piece. Thank you. Meg. Well, that was a question I was going to ask and pivot in a little bit. Um, I guess I was curious, I know, this has been very moving and I've, I think it's amazing that you made it through. Was there anything that was hardest? And um, how did your faith help you with that? And also in the support that you were giving the teachers, did you share some of, did you share things that came from your faith? in a non, in a non, you know, in a secular way. Right. Yeah. The mandala I definitely shared with people, <laughs> um, you know, when I was, as the way I talked about it, which I do think comes from a spiritual practice, but um, but also I shared it in a very secular way. Um, and I, because I put it as my signature, I did have people go, what is that? What's that thing? So it, it brought it up. Um, so I was able to share that in that way. And a couple of people, especially my colleagues who had similar jobs um, said, oh, thank you. That's really helpful <laughs> to think about it that way. You're right, just, we've got to just let it go and not get caught up. School administrators, I feel like I wasn't supposed to be a school administrator because I don't fit the bill. In general, school administrators are very anxious, very like they want things just so they want to be able to, you know, I think that's why you go into administration. <laughs> um, and so we really need that people to say like, it's not going to be perfect. Let it go. Um, in that way, what was hardest? I mean, I think what was hardest is hard to answer. And that's why I kind of brought you through the journey because it's changed, right? Like in each phase of everything, there was a hardest thing. At the beginning, it was just like, oh my God, what is this? What is a pandemic? How, like, and and the fear, you know, like we, we really lived, I think to some extent yeah. we're also living in fear. But yeah. <laughs> when I think back to April, say of 2020, the fear, fear and anxiety of the actual disease was much stronger and more palpable than it is now, right? So, so that, just getting people, that I feel like my biggest challenge was helping the teachers, you know, feel okay about taking care of their families. And, you know, we've got teachers who are single living by themselves, so that's hard because they're isolated. We've got teachers who've got little kids and they're like, how am I supposed to teach those kids over there when I'm also homeschooling my teachers here and everything in between. So it's just, you know, it was trying to respond to that. Um, but I think, I think that's why I kept coming back in this talk to the justice piece, because that's the piece that um, I really held on to, especially because we had families who really were like, no masks and get the kids in there all the time. And you guys are, you know, being ridiculous. And the other families 
who felt we were being too loose and, you know, wanting to kids keep their kids home and, and feeling we weren't being protective enough. And so just remembering about that piece about equity and justice and just saying, you know what, I need to think about what's best for the whole and do that. And there's always going to be outliers and trying to understand that and, you know, give to people. Um, and sometimes I couldn't give them what they wanted, but at least what I could give them was my ear and say, I understand. And this is, you know, we have to move forward in this way and just make them feel kind of supported that way. Um, but it's hard to say what's hardest because it shifted as we go through yeah. the different cases. And I wonder if you could please make that beautiful um, mosaic, um, mosaic yep. poem available somehow. Sure. Um, I guess I could put it on FPLEX chat. Would that be the best? That would way be great. Okay, sure. Thank you right. so much. Thanks, Meg. Um, I saw Helen and Don's hand. Yeah, um, I just, uh, the, the slide about the quality, equity, and justice was really helpful. Um, oh. So, I mean, actually what I most want to say to you is what other people are saying or thinking, just how extraordinary what you've done is. I, it, this, this whole time I've thought, how can the schools manage this at all? <laughs> Um, and we we have kept close in touch with our grandchildren, and they've had to you know go through anything and everything, and I it's just been so difficult. And you know you're a blessing, <laughs> and people like you who give their time and love and the the energy and attention and intelligence and all the things that do make it happen, and. You know, I do. The other thing is something you've emphasized that Lexington is a very fortunate place for so many reasons. And I'm hoping that what we're seeing about the equity, equality, justice issues will be something that we'll be carrying into, you know, our life in the world and and spreading as much as we can to to see just how challenging things must be for people in, in less fortunate circumstances. So I appreciate your bringing that up. Thank you. Yeah, it's definitely um, a community, both you know the larger community and the the school community. And because of all the resources that this town has, you know, I got a lot of support too. So it's definitely um, work together, and and community is really important to get through anything like this. So. Yeah, I'm glad you had a lot of people to work with. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I saw David Rose and then I saw David Horton, so. We're entering the David portion of this. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, so kudos to you, uh, same, Katie. Um, so I had this wonderful conversation with Liz Safir, who lots of you know sings in the choir and so on. Uh, who has three kids and she said this won't be a surprise to you uh that it was the worst years imaginable for one of her kids the best year you know this is back up six months ago for one of her kids and eh, for the other mm -hmm. and that diversity is as you know pretty common um but i wondered if out of that you've learned some things both from the kids for whom it was worst and for whom it was better. Uh, what are some things that we can take away as positives from all of this? I mean, what did the schools or you learn? That you go, you know what? That uh, is something we should pay attention to. Um, you know, was there any benefits from all of this? Right. Um, I will say that I have tried to think of that and we haven't given it the focused attention we need to because there's always a new thing to come up with. Um, but I will say some of the things that I've noticed and that we've talked about um, with administrators across the district, even though the state is not allowing remote learning anymore, um, everyone has gotten so used to and appreciating the ability to connect as we all are now in this way. And so definitely, um, this is not quite on the students, but it, it is important for the students that 
holding parent-teacher conferences, we're like, we are always going to allow virtual conferences from now on, you know, um, for families that don't work locally or, you know, that work, but not so locally, it's easy for them to take a lunch break and take a 20 minute virtual call um, that they couldn't, you know, travel and have to take a day off. So that's one piece. But as far as the kids specifically, we, we have to do more thinking on that. Um, I think you know, as I talked about the mandala approach and I shared that a little bit and you're making me think maybe I should try to share that more proactively and intentionally with staff. I, but I think everyone has learned, has learned to be more flexible like that. And actually in our data team today, one of the third grade teachers said that they're like, you know, a silver lining of this whole thing is the kids are so much more flexible. They, because of what they've had to go through when something doesn't go right, she's like, I don't know, a couple of years ago, I wonder if it's her <laughs> as much as the kids. Um, but she said a couple of years ago, if something didn't work the way it should, it felt like, oh my gosh, what are we gonna do? And she said, now when, you know, technology fails, the kids are like, oh, okay. And, you know, let's do it this way. And they can shift more easily. Um, so I think that has um, allowed for more flexibility. And I think teachers are getting used to being more flexible. At the same time, um, change is hard. And um, so in some ways, I think people have really latched onto whatever they could and held it for dear life because everything else was changing. So I do hope that we continue to keep shifting as we move back to the new normal. I don't wanna go back to the old normal. I wanna shift. Um, and the teachers have, um, because, you know, just like I shared my slides here, teachers had to learn to use slide decks like that for their teaching because of the way, you know, the modality of teaching and have really found that that has helped. So they've continued using that in the way, and it, that does make it very accessible um, because there's the visual component, there's a lot more video. The teachers have gotten much more used to using like smart board technology, um, which is much more engaging for the students. Um, so there's a lot more of that technology integration, but not so much that kids are sitting in front of a screen all day. You know, I, I think we really appreciate the in-person kind of piece. Um, so, so there's all of that. Um, but as a district, we are looking to, we're looking to UDL, David, to be quite honestly, um, of really figuring out, you know, that is something that the district is really looking at integrating is trying to find ways for those of you who don't know what UDL is. Um, I'm not going to have David explain it. He'll do that another time. But, but I will say that the way to quickly say just really making sure there's a lot more choice and voice in, in school for kids um, and finding lots of different ways for students to take in learning and to share their learning um, in a way in that way. And I think that this experience has made us realize that we need to be more flexible. And so we're hoping to build on that. Thank you. Uh, I see David Horton. <clears throat> excuse, me, excuse me. Hi, Kitty. Thank you. And thank you for connecting uh, Unitarian Universalism with life in the schools and your life. That was really very, very interesting and, and uh, very rewarding for me. And, and the notion of Mandela and what, what that all means, I'm going to hold on to. I will hold on to. Uh, but my question really was around did you, uh, did you, what resources were, were available for you and, and for teachers to, in a sense, get through this? And could you, we've all talked about and all recognized uh, how problematic that was for teachers who, on all sorts of levels and categories and whatever. Did you, did the, the system, did you sort of seek your, in addition to having uh, your faith to support you, did, did you seek outside resources or did the school system help teachers and you as administrator with resources to uh, get through all this and to continue it? Yeah. Continue it? Um, so as administrator, I'll talk quickly to that first. Um, it was just more us helping each other, you know, and I have heard stories 
of years ago, um, administrators being more siloed and not being as collaborative and the buildings kind of being each of their own islands. And it doesn't feel that way anymore. And people who have been building administrators in Lexington for many years have said they've noticed that. I don't know if it's because of the pandemic, but I imagine it had to help that we just really needed to lean on each other and help each other out. And so um, another silver lining in that way is we're much more collaborative group. And so the support we got was more just helping each other and sharing with each other. Um, again, you know, I the the incredible resources of Lexington um, and most of the teachers that I've spoken to recognize how lucky they were to be in Lexington at the time because in Lexington we have you know the superintendent of schools and then a bunch of people and including a direct you know superintendent of curriculum and instruction and under that person you know someone who's specific to k to five schools and someone else who's six to twelve schools and under them there's a literacy person for each of the different grade spans so elementary middle and high school there's a math person for each of the grade spans so the teachers were really well supported in that way that um and also even within the math and literacy departments there are coaches um, so people, their literacy coaches, that their job is just to help teachers learn the curriculum and implement the curriculum, and same for math. So through all of this, especially from like April of 2020 through August of 2020, those department leaders and their staff of coaches really spent those months developing these slide decks, looking at the curriculum, that there was a lot taken out of the curriculum. So to Omar's point of like, ooh, what happened to the teaching? We did look closely at that and worry about academically what might be lost um, because there are, were whole parts of the curriculum we had to cut out because you couldn't do it. You know, you couldn't get to every piece because the modality was so different. Um, but they did a great job of figuring out what to take out so that it it didn't make a big blip, right? The kids are still doing really well and learned things. So these curriculum people really kind of created the teaching slides for teachers to use, pushed those out um, <clears throat> as much as they could. I mean, sometimes, and then they were doing that all last year. So every two weeks, the teachers would get the slide deck for the next two weeks. And then teaching teams like the fourth graders would all spend their collaborative time. It's called professional learning communities, PLC time. Um, they have at least an hour a week, but they'd go even more over that, but they would <coughs> come together. And what I saw most of the teams doing was like, all right, I'll look at the math slides and I'll look at the literacy slides and I'll look at that. And they kind of divided that up and they each became kind of experts in that and shared with each other. Um, so they were heavily supported by the departments in the actual curriculum. So what the teachers had to do was just really think about, all right, knowing the kids in front of me, how am I going to deliver this in a way that they'll get it and really just try to adapt. So again, the very well-resourced town of Lexington, there were a lot of people who could do that so that um, the teachers here, and they'll still tell you that this year, this 2021-2022 school year is the hardest year of their teaching ever. Um, not last year when they had to do the hybrid stuff, but but this year um, of the trying to go back to normal and the expectations are rising back up, but coming out of all of this. Um, so even in Lexington, it was really hard. And my heart goes out to people who are in districts who didn't have that level of support. Thank you, Katie. Thanks. I see Anne. Oh, you're still muted. Thanks so much for doing this. Um, I am curious about um, how you feel or what your take is on being an elementary school principal and versus um, the experience of middle school or high school principals. Where do you think the stressors are? Did you sort of think, thank heavens, I'm working with elementary school kids or that <laughs> others have it easier? Um, I haven't given that too much thought, except that mm -hmm. as an elementary person, there's six elementary schools and middle school, there's only two. Mm -hmm. And then high school, there's only one. So I, I do feel fortunate to be in the biggest pool, right? So for more collaboration and more ideas coming together. Um, I think, <clears throat> 
I think um, like the social emotional piece, we're more worried about the elementary school kids like looking a couple of years down the road. So in data teams today, talking to the second grade team, we were like, or no, I'm sorry, the third grade team, but thinking of, um, we were like, you know what? Here's some second grade lessons around social emotional stuff, not the academics, but the how to be a good friend, how to make a friend, how to you know be a friend, those kinds of lessons. Um, the counts, school counselor was saying, I'm going to send you these second grade lessons to do with your third graders because they missed that, right? They missed not just the lesson, but the, the opportunity to practice because they, they don't play in the way that they used to, um, you know, they don't get together with friends that's getting better but you know a lot of that year you know you think about the end of the kids who are third grade now the spring of their first grade year they kind of sheltered at home right I mean I'm sure some families you know bubbled and all of that um, but some families and I think particularly with um, especially at the beginning of the pandemic with a very high Asian population in this town a lot of Asian families felt that that anti-Asian violence stuff, you know, that they were worried about. There's a lot of stigma. Um, a lot of the Asian families really felt the stigma of like, if they got sick, how that, you know, had much more stigma than if a white family got sick, you know, with COVID and all of that. So there was, a. so I think in general, um, my experience is that um, when we looked at the remote learning, um, some one of my, the teachers was like, wait, you've got to do something about my class. There's only one white kid. You've got to balance it better. I'm like, that's because that's the only white kid in your grade level who's doing remote learning. It, it, I did see those kinds of dynamics happening that immigrant families tended to choose the remote learning more so than um, white uh, native, like as far as, you know, not immigrants. Um, to town. So that's a whole nother level that I don't know why I'm going there. Um, except thinking about that, that some families chose to really shelter their families at home for a whole host of reasons. But what that meant was they didn't get the natural socialization piece. So I guess in the moment, I think most kids are fine, but we do wonder, like, let's look two or three years down the line here. Um, what's going to, you know, what are these kids emotionally and socially going to be dealing with? Cause they missed out on kindergarten, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, whereas for the middle and high school kids, I think that there was a more immediate need, right? The kids suffered that lack of connection more immediately. I think of, you know, McKenna was in eighth grade when it all hit um, and then ninth grade um, and not being able to like, go to football games, you know, like this year feels more like a typical social high school year for him, even though he sees his friends with a mask on, he, he at least does, you know, and do those kind of normal high school teenager kid things. Um, so I think those older kids had the immediate impact in the moment, but I think in the long run, they'll be okay. As an elementary person, I'm more worried about like watching this cohort of kids over the next few years and seeing how it might impact them long term. Well, thanks for taking the time to do this on top of all the other things you have to do. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for coming. I was like, I don't know who's going to show up and if people are being interested in this. So thanks for those of you who hung on long enough that it must have done something. So it was great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Wonderful. And thanks to everyone for coming. And we hope you'll come next week when um, Larry Prusak will tell us another story. <laughs> and thanks to Ruth and Omar and Meg, and I don't know who else was involved in putting this together, but they did a lot of work to get this together for you all too. So thank you. Don Cohen too. And oh, and Don, yes, thank you. Yeah. Don's the one who called me. Thank you, Don. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Katie. Thank, thank you, you, Katie, so much. Yeah. And uh, 